Hi, everybody, and welcome to a special edition of Second Sunday Book of Ruby Helmet. And you can see that my guest is Cara Black. She snuck in there for a close up, and she'll be back in just a second <laughs> to talk about her brand new book. I don't, it's called Three Hours in Paris. And I don't know when I've been more excited to uh, talk to Cara, as you know, she's a good friend. I don't know if it was when Chloe was born and, and she doesn't <laughs> have a kid or if it's now, because this is Cara's very first standalone uh, thriller and boy, is it a thriller. It's, it's an amazing story and we're gonna get into that in just a second. Um, but let me just do one little piece of housekeeping here, and that is to tell you that Second Sunday Books is a trademark podcast um, presentation, which is solely owned by Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. Okay, welcome, Cara. Uh, hey, Libby, thanks for having me again. <laughs> oh, wow, it's my pleasure. I mean, every, you know, this is such a, this is such a, different kind of uh, situation because it's not a May. So tell, oh, by the way, oh, I forgot to say, by the way, it's been getting wonderful reviews. You got a starred review from Booklist. Uh, you got a great review from PW. Um, tell us, uh, Kirkus gave you a review? Yeah, I think I got a starred review in Library Journal too. Um, yeah. yeah, and uh, the Sunday Times in the UK reviewed it, which was out of the blue. Um, the LA Times, Paula Woods, someone we both know, a writer, and sure. Paula gave it an incredible review. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just, it's also, I think, an Amazon top 10 pick. And um, I'm just really surprised. Really? Yeah. It's an Amazon top 10 pick? Oh. Ah, I'm so jealous. Oh, and it's a uh, what indie next best list. So I'm I'm just really thrilled. Um, you know, I'm kind of slow to the start because like 19 books it took me to write a standalone. Um, and so many people, as you and many of our colleagues who were began writing at the same time are getting published, you know, I've written different series, several standalones, and again, I'm late to the game, but um but you got there. I got there, you know, like the tortoise and the hare, I always say, you know, um, and it was a book I had to write. It was not a book. It was, it was something that <clears throat> just kept knocking at that door and here in my little garret of an office, I, I have all these notes when I went to Paris and, you know, about the history and things people told me, something I discovered, uh, um, bullet holes in a building and heard the story where it came from. And I'm like, writing notes and taking photos and every time I would come home from Paris I'd have all these incredible things that did not go into a May book and as we both know as writers sometimes you try to shoehorn all the information and this was not shoehorning <laughs> this needed to be its own separate pile <clears throat> so tell us tell us the story and how it came to you and why it was so important for you to write this sure can I show you the beautiful cover of course, of course. That, can you see it? Keep it, wait, wait. I had, Go ahead, talk. I had nothing to do with the cover. It was designed by Janine at Soho, and I just love it. And if I could share the incredible, lift it higher, okay, <laughs> map, uh, circa 1940s, as close as we could get it to the, you know, some of the street names have changed. But this is a Paris map, circa 1940. It's uh, with some of the landmarks that the Germans took over, and it has the root of Kate Reese, my uh, protagonist. And I just want to say that people always say, um, I actually walked and biked every bit of her route and the other characters. So it, it can be done. <laughs> so, no. um, so, so yeah, you, it was tell us how the story got 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 to you. How did you figure it out? Yeah, well, it's been a long journey for me because, as I said, I would be going to Paris and hearing these in historical nuggets and these these incredible things, and and I knew they belonged, and I knew there was a big story. Um, when I found in a history book a, a footnote, literally a historical footnote 
And it said at the bottom, Adolf Hitler came to Paris for three hours. And then he left abruptly, never to return. Now, it was two weeks into the German occupation. Paris had been declared an open city, so it wouldn't be destroyed. Hitler comes. Why was there no parade down the Champs-Élysées with Hitler? Why didn't these things happen? And why, if you look at the YouTube video, which you can do and see Hitler's, uh, you know, turn around Paris and his whole tour, why there's a lot of things that don't quite make sense. But of course, Goebbels, his propaganda minister, who was the pioneer of full news, if we ever want to think of a pioneer, you know, just edited this whole thing and it was a big uh, publicity coup. But a lot of it didn't make sense to me. And I was like, what? Then I read, if I can show another picture. Can you see that? Yeah, can you move it a little bit? Yeah, move it up. Yeah, perfect. Get, get it a little closer. Great, go. Okay, so there's Hitler on his visit to Paris, three hours, and um, on his... On one side is Albert Speer, his architect, uh, I think with the cap, and Arno Brecker, his sculptor, this guy, right there. Uh, he brought his art team, and you can see they're in Paris. Now, you can see them in the, in the YouTube video. But after the war, <clears throat> they both survived. Albert Speer served prison time, and they both wrote their memoirs or their recounts of being in the Third Reich, and, and of course, was this was included this visit? <clears throat> uh, in his notes, June twenty third, early like five six a.m. in the morning, that they came to Paris, which would make sense because it was a day or two after the armistice was signed near the Belgian border. Our, uh, Albert Speer, the architect, wrote that it was a week later both documented in their books <clears throat> and they were friends this was never disputed and that just to me it was like two and two make five mm -hmm. something happened what if this hurried visit was um, you know was precipitated by an attempt on Hitler's life because we know there were many many attempts on Hitler's life how he survived them all you know it's like a cat with 20 lives <clears throat> So I knew there was a story there. I felt it was really plausible. Mm -hmm. Did you have any reservations about writing World War II since there are so many books about World War II currently on the market? Actually, I think these books on World War II are having a moment and they've been having a moment for a while. I'd love to read them. I know you like them too. Um, but again, I've been working on this book for about 10 years, so it's kind of gone through different cycles. Um, what, what came to me was that the stories and the, the anecdotes I heard and um, the, the pieces of information I found were real. And these were told to me by everyday people. These were people who had lived there during the war. Now, I have some friends, um, one is 90 years old, and he was a resistant, and um, I've been very worried about him because during the COVID virus in Paris, he's sort of been staying in his home, but I finally got through to him and he's getting food, so that's great, and he's taken care of, but um, the things that he has told me and other resistance I met, even a female resistance who are almost 100 years old now, or when I met them, uh, they tell me about these things. And, hmm? Give us an example of the kind of stories that you heard. Um, well, when I met Jean, Janine, actually from Lyon, uh, she was 96 and she was, uh, we met for coffee. She was a friend of my other friend and we would go to the cafe and she said, I was, I'm from Lyon. I was about, you know, I was a young mother and I was working there in my father's uh, printing shop during the war because my husband was away. And my father would give me something and uh, put it in my <clears throat> bike rack and just say, go, you know, take this to, you know, outside uh, Lyon. And she found out she was at first bringing, you know, um, papers and then she was bringing little guns that her father would put 
uh, you know, and she would be driving out and she was a mother and she had children at home, you know, and she, I said, well, wow, you're so courageous. And she said, I just did what had to be done. You know, I wasn't, you know, mm. and I, I feel that's a big part of what I heard you people. It was war and you did what had to be done. I also um, read a story about a, a, a British woman they found, oh, maybe 10 years ago in a coastal town. <clears throat> And uh, this old woman was found dead in her in her house. Uh, everyone felt terrible because she died alone, and no one knew she had family. They didn't think she did, and and uh, you know they're like they have to give her a pauper's uh, a grave in the cemetery. Uh, and then people started going through. She had a Légion d'honneur, the Croix de Guerre, a British, uh, you know, all these medals from the war. And this woman had uh, lived quietly, never, you know, never made a show of herself. And everyone said, well, we, if we had known, you know, we would have really wanted to talk with her. And there, she, they said, well, she took the uh, special, the, um, what is it, the Oath of Secrecy, the Official Secrets Act that you sign in Britain. And she signed it and it was like, you never speak of this again. And she took it to the grave. And there's a whole generation like that of people whose stories beg to be told um so where how did the uh <laughs> character of kate emerge and what what is her role i know she's the protagonist kate reese is the protagonist she's a young woman from oregon she grew up during the depression with five brothers a uh, hard scrabble life rural oregon her father was a migrant ranch foreman which meant he moved around ranches. <clears throat> she, uh, she had to work on the ranch. She had to also learn how to shoot, to defend the ranch from feral animals and to hunt and, you know, for their food. Um, and uh, grew up during the depression. And I knew, and, and her descendants, she would be a descendant of like frontier women, people who came over in covered wagons because some of those Oregonians, boy, they're, they're special and they're tough and they're they're of the country yet they come from this incredible background into to and for for Kate who is a rifle woman who takes a job as an assassin we won't say too much about that but that would be so how could that be a, a normal organic part of a character well if she's someone like Kate who grew up in backwoods rural Oregon and learned to shoot when she you know was very young Shooting would be part of her life. She would be extremely accurate. Being resilient, because I think working on a, I wanted a character who could sort of roll with the punches. Of course, they're, they're dealing with, and how to, how to come back and think on their feet. Now, if you run a ranch, just think even present day or in the 1930s, it's snowing, you're in labor. What if you're having a baby? And one of the uh, fences break and the cattle are going to escape. You get up and you go and you rope those cattle and close that fence. You have no, no other alternative. Or if, um, you know, they need to be fed, you know, you, you've got a fever. I mean, the animals and your, is your, don't wait. And so I think when you grow up on a farm or a ranch, you know that you've got to get in there and make do and have it work, <clears throat> figure it out. So I thought that's the kind of woman that we need for this, you know, and well, a woman. When we meet her, she's not an assassin, right? She's, she's married, she has a child. What happens? Um, yeah, when we meet her, in the, well, sort of meet her in the next chapter, yes. She is, um, she's married to a Welshman who is serving up in the Orkney Islands of Scotland. They have a baby. 18 month old and uh he's he's serving in the war and um and she's working in a munitions factory mm -hmm. there on the base Linus in orkney and i actually it was so fun to do this research it's very hard to see but they're trying to oh. reclaim can you see that yeah cool okay they're actually trying to reclaim all the, it was this huge base and very important uh, na uh, in, the, in the marine um, strategic from coming from Norway, which the Germans occupied through up there in the north. 
very strategic. Um, Churchill had gone to visit that when he was a minister of the Marines before he became the prime minister. Um, so they're up there um, and Kate is working in a munitions factory, totally underutilized because she's a Marks woman, but she's a woman and that's the only job she could get. But she's also there with her baby and her husband is there because he's serving. And it's kind of great for her because she's out of her prissy mother-in-law's house in Wales and she's out in this beautiful island of Orkney where you hear the sea all the time, where there are these monoliths of the Vikings. There's, you know, all these farm animals and birds and, and yet, you know, there's people around. So I think for Kate, it's, it's a great place, you know, with her family. Um, it's, a, it's a bewitching place up there. So um, that's where she is when, um, when her daughter um, suffers a febrile convulsion and then a lot of things happen and there's an attack based in a real a German submarine attack on the um, on the harbor blowing up a ship it's a very famous incident thousands were killed and it was a submarine that snuck through in the Orkney Islands so that was a place to start and she I don't want to say too much but there's a tragedy that happens Kate is thrown um, and uh, just goes to work like a like auto automaton, you know, automatic, you know, like machine. Yeah, and she, uh, you know, she really has nothing to live for. You know, she's going. She can't go back to America, right? It's during the war. You can't cross the Atlantic. Um, and then uh, she's recruited. Mm. She's got nothing, nothing to live for until she's recruited, and then she has a mission. So let, let me ask you a little bit about plotting because, you know, there's a way that we do thrillers. Um, what was important to you as you plotted this? What was important when I plotted this? Well, the time was compressed, okay? We've got basically uh, when she attempts to assassinate someone, there's a deadline of person who's investigating her, the German investigator, has 36 hours to find mm -hmm. this I assassin. Really if it was that close to deadline, I guess, I guess. Okay, go ahead. Well, when the Fuhrer gives a deadline, that's, that's what they do. <laughs> find, find it. Um, it was interesting to have her, uh, interesting plot-wise, to work within that time frame, okay, and how, and which really helped in a way that every, I tried to go through the day with each character, hour by hour, a segment of time, because we, we, you know, it's very compressed. An incident happens, there's, someone needs to be caught. So there's a, you know, a ticking, mm -hmm. a ticking clock, a ticking bomb. And then there's underneath it is this subtext of another uh, uh, betrayal. And, uh, you know, who is the mole in the resistance? Who is the betrayer? And who, you know, so, so it was very important to always, um, and um, I don't outline as you know, but after a while I realized I needed on the walls here, which you can't see very well, but I wanted to, I made timelines, Kate's timeline, what she would be doing, what Gunther, the German investigator would be doing, what, um, you know, what they would be doing back in London. And I realized that in cutting back and forth, um, was a, a was a rewriting exercise after it was written i realized i would insert different time events that, and chapter that probably really helped the pacing a lot made it, exactly. made it almost impossible for someone to put it down yeah and the stakes were pretty high you know <laughs> so that was great i mean you know when I'm writing the Amy LeDuc books, as much as I love them, there's always an investigation, there's her life, there's the baby, um, you know, and uh, I'm not right, those are not thrillers per se, but this is definitely, you know, we got life or death, we've got, you know, Nazis, you know, we have someone on the run, you know. <laughs> so, so um, I hope, well, okay, no, I don't, I can't say it because it's a spoiler, but, um, I, I want to say that neither 
nah, I can't say it. You guys are going to have to read the book. And it is definitely a one night book because you won't be able to put it down. Um, I think it's your best work in years. Thank you, Libby. Thank you. Thank you. And you and I did many plotting sessions over this book. So uh, I know, I know. I, I, I'm glad to have a teeny, teeny little bit of, bit of there myself. But um, what was the hardest thing for you to do in this, in writing this book? It was getting to know Kate. Kate was the handle I needed to, to grab. Uh, at first, I had just said she would be this frontier woman, this outdoor woman. She would have this, uh, you know, incredible skill. And then I thought, oh, she'll be from Montana or Wyoming, and I'm trying to write that. And and um, I knew a woman from Wyoming. Yeah, this is what they. This is what it's like. I'm from Wyoming, and this is what our town is like. And and I was, you know, but I've never been to Wyoming. I've never been to Montana. But when I was going through all this, I was on book tour in Oregon. My next, I'm, I live in San Francisco, so it's just the next state up. And, I, and I've been to Oregon many times, and I was talking to my friend Maureen there, and Maureen was saying, well, she said, you know, we have some really strong ladies here, uh, descendants of uh, some of the people who came over in covered wagons and lived through the depression. Why don't you talk to them? And I'm like, she goes, and second of all, why couldn't your character be from Oregon? And I went, you are totally right. Why not? Because I know Oregon more. I got to talk with her and, and uh, go through the historical archives and the recountings of people, especially women who had lived on ranches during the Depression. Um, so that was, I was like, yes, I, what, why did I make this so hard? Um, also, Mary Vollmer, who is another Soho author and who, who lives not too far away. We were meeting uh, one time and we were talking and she goes, yeah, you know, my grandmother's uh, father, my grandmother grew up on um, ranches during the depression, more Northern California. And there was such a thing as a migrant ranch foreman because of course there were migrant ranch workers, um, but there were foremen too, because maybe they'd work a season uh, you know, or during a, you know, a cattle drive on one ranch and move to another because it was the, it was the depression and farmers could, or ranch owners couldn't always afford to have many stuff, you know. And I was like, I was like, yeah, I mean, that's kind of the lowest of the low in the ranking that you can't even live and stay and grow up on one ranch, that you've got to be moved around because of mm -hmm. the economic circumstances. And that, you know, so that, that really helped. And also I thought anyone who grows up with five brothers, they got, they got a handle on a lot of things, you know, they can handle stuff. Yeah. 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 What was the part that you had the most fun with? The part I had the most fun with. Um, well, um, because I, uh, would pass this corset shop often on the bus to go to visit my friend in Northern Paris, Clavery. And it, it has, it's Belle Epoque, it's incredible. It is still there. I mean, you will go by in the bus, you go, oh my God. Um, and it was a corset shop run by this family for, uh, I mean, since the mid 1800s uh, until, the until about in, in the late 1990s. But the, now it's a perfume shop, but it's a storefront. And I was like, there is so, and I would see all these old corsets, you know, these beautiful, you know, silk um, confections and thinking there's so many stories here. I started to do some research about it and found out, yes, the corsetiers were, was a great um, profession that women had, um, you know, making for women who, in the Folie Bergère, the Moulin Rouge, for Josephine Baker, for Arletti, for the films, for stage, it was a, an incredible um, metier profession. And you would go and you would fit your, um, the actress, or, and you would, you know, they would have their own wardrobe of different corsets, and it, would, and it was quite a skill, and it was just so, I don't know, I thought it was fascinating. And so that um, when I wanted to, I wanted to set a scene there, you know, and I wanted to have a corsetier. Remember, help I remember that scene. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I could use this, you know, uh, this corset shop, which, which you will, you know, it's still there. And I could use the background behind and delve into this wonderful profession that a woman would do 
uh, especially a woman like the person here in the story. I mean, she has children, but this is her job and, and what she does and, and how, how you look at it in a feminine way. And it, it was also a chance to explore how Parisians who have often been criticized for wearing stockings and putting on makeup and looking good during the occupation, that was a form of resistance, mm -hmm. you know? And I wanted this character to kind of explain it to Kate, you know, like, yeah, we are resisting in our own way, you know, a different way, mm -hmm. which I thought was a nice window. So, so she's, an, um, she's a really unique character and you, you came up with a whole bunch of unique characters to people this book. Um, did they just come to you fully formed or did you have to work on developing them in terms of where their politics were, where their feelings about the war was, what kind of people um, they were going to be, how they were going to treat Kate? Well, I think I read too many John le Carré novels over my life, <laughs> especially my father's. You know, I would find them when I was a teenager, you know, this bio came in from the, all of them and read them. And then of course, over the years we, and looking at them it, to, to not have a bit of a jaundiced eye about the British Secret Service, MI5, MI6, you know, kind of whatever. Um, and I'll blame Monsieur Le Carré, but um, I think a lot was going on and it was wartime. So for me, a character who would recruit Kate, the British guy, would, would be a man who is very savvy who had served in World War I, a vet, who um, would uh, be running a, uh, a, a precursor of the Special Operations Executive, the SOE, um, which was, it was a seat of the pants, it existed, a seat of the pants organization. They took people who were not part of the old boy network, the elite from Oxford and Eton and all that, or from certain military, these were people who had certain skills. A lot of them were foreigners, <clears throat> like Kate, and they could do things and think out of the box. They were inventors. Um, and I, can I show one more thing? They were, I found this in a Stanford archive. I wasn't looking for it. I didn't, I don't know why I found it, but thank God I did. It's an S phone. Can you see that? Yes. Is that cool? Wait a minute. Go ahead. Okay, so the S phone is is something that they developed um, ultra high frequency secret secret radio telephone, so that you could be making contact with people. You know, not like through your iPhone, but it's kind of like you could be making contact, and um, it's headset. Um, it was, an, it was an incredible way for the operator to face on the ground up to the aircraft to help them land. You know, we've seen all the movies where people are, uh, you know, landing on a field where they put out all the, uh, the flares and everything. And that's very, very dangerous, right? Because you're revealing your spot if someone's right. dropping. So these were different other ways. Um, so there was a lot of very cool things. Um, so I, I tried to use that and thought, how would they look at this modern technology, uh, you know, in those days, and try to convince the powers that be the military, who were really, you know, we've never done this, we don't want to do this, which I think resonates today. Um, and Gunther, the German investigator, um, he came to me because he was, uh, uh, who would who would at that time have this kind of job? It would be someone who grew up during the Weimar Republic, which was a you know time of chaos in Germany and not having you know food. They'd have to bring uh, wheelbarrows full of marks to to buy a loaf of bread, or you know that kind of time. And uh, he would have been someone who um, his mother dropped off. Uh, at, at his uncle's uh, doorstep, didn't know his father. His uncle was a policeman. His uncle gave him order. He gave him cause and effect and expectations. And if you do something like this, this will happen. And he put food in his mouth and a coat on his back. So Gunter always appreciated the regularity and that you could, if you plotted along enough, you will get there, which his uncle told him. So he makes a very, he goes, he becomes, you know, a policeman because his, you know, and he likes the order and he likes the fact that there's some certainty, 
when we do this, we have the evidence and we do the job, it will come there. Of course, he becomes a tool of the Nazis because of that time, but he's a very, very good policeman, a detective. Was, was there a French investigator also? Or uh, uh, Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, there's a resistance member. Okay. Yeah. Maybe it was I'm part of this sewer network. <laughs> Everybody wore a different job. <laughs> and I have to say, uh, Day of the Jackal, uh, that, that film and the book by Frederick Forsyth, I think that inspired me because I, you know, I just watch it. I watched it every year. I just watched it. But there's something about the government. They try to find the assassin for de Gaulle. And we all know de Gaulle lives, yet it's nail biting. And it's that point where they don't know they're just politicians and they don't know how to find someone so who do they call you know they call the top detective of the day and he comes in and he finds the jackal and prevents the assassin so i think right. there is something about that that always influenced me not that this is the same but. day of the jackal is the only movie i know of where you know from the beginning what the end is you know the gall was not assassinated and yet you're on the edge of your seat during the entire film. It's, it's an amazing film that way in terms of suspense. Exactly. Well, spoiler alert, Hitler does not get assassinated. <laughs> <laughs> well, we well. Have another, we know, okay, we, we, we do know that. Um, our time is, is a little, is over, almost over, but before we went, I wanted just to find out what's going on with M.A and uh, when she's coming around again. I'm working on the next Aimé Le Duc, which would be the 20th in the series, but I, but there's 21, but okay, so I goofed up when I was writing the Aimé Le Duc books. I always said I would write one in each arrondissement. I actually wrote two. Um, I wrote Murder on Ile Saint-Louis, which I know is one of your favorites, and another one set in this a murder in the Marais, which is both the third arrondissement. So I've got to write 21 to get every arrondissement. So I'm, I'm about two thirds of the way done through a draft. And I'm really, you know, you know, working on it this morning. And, um, and then I have an idea after the next day made to write a story about uh, post-war France. Uh, possibly. One more. Is that the one I about, or is that the is that the uh, about uh, the one with the woman's name in the in the in the title? You get, you get, yeah, you get. Yeah. Oh, this is I'm um, so excited for that one because you get is the mistress of Amy Leduc's grandfather, um, right? Claude. We read Claude in other books. Claude has a mistress that Amy doesn't want to know about, and I've always thought, what is? What is the mistress's story? So I'm really exploring that, a story about how the mistress uh, became the mistress. <laughs> yes, I recall Post you're pretty Post much war. done with it, aren't you? I mean, you pretty much know where it's going. Unless you oh, I know where it's going. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm working on that. Yeah, that will, that, when I finish the next day, May, we're, I'm going on to that. And hope, hopefully. Okay. Very different. It's very different from this story. Yeah. But I have to say, I was so happy to write this story because it's been always there and I had to write it and I just had to, you know, and I wanted it to be a woman's story, not that men haven't read it and liked it. I don't mean it's only a woman's story, but I wanted a story of a woman who did things, not just men, because it's always about men, male assassins, you know, women had a huge role. I mean, no one would ever suspect a woman like it. I mean, in the, in the story, she uses uh, being a cleaner as a cover, uh, being an older woman, um, but you're not going to really suspect a woman with a bunch of eggs in her basket or, you know, with wearing a cleaning outfit. You know, that's the, uh, uh, Robin Agnew was saying, was that some kind of, uh, you know, feminist thing? And I went, you could interpret it like that, but it's also what women, know. you just blend in with the, no, with the you know, in, in blend in with the walls and then when you get to a certain age you're invisible right so 
Right. <laughs> no, no, so, use it. Not us. We're right here. Okay. Not us. No, no. But I heard. <laughs> <Never mind. laughs> All right, uh, Cara. It's been wonderful to spend time with you. Um, and if you're still listening or watching, you really need to get three hours in Paris. You will not be disappointed. It is an amazing read, and and Cara deserves all sorts of kudos for writing it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Libby. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everybody. And we will be back again next month with another edition of Second Sunday Books. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, stay well. <laughs>